Welcome back, everyone, to episode 14 of the My Not Business podcast presented by Bennett Creative Media. I am your host, Easton Bennett, and today we have not one but two exciting guests on the show, Alexis Meyer and Tim Mahalik. How are you guys doing today? Good. How are Great. you? I am doing fantastic. Happy another, to be here. Yes, another day of filming the podcast. It's always exciting. <laughs> awesome. Um, so just to get right into it, we like to just get right into the questions. Okay. Talk about what you guys do. You can talk about a generic scope, and then we'll get into a little bit more details. So... Okay. Whoever wants to take it away first, what do you guys do? Well, I'll jump on that first since I've uh, I've got a little more history with HostFest. Um, I've been on the board of the HostFest, you know, I'm not even sure, probably 10 years. Okay. Um, and that's this is a volunteer job, so I still have a day job that keeps me busy. I work at First Western Bank and Trust. Um, but, you know, HostFest has been such a pillar of uh, the Mina community um, throughout the years. Um, it, it was, you know, it's been, it was nice to keep it moving along. As you well know, COVID came, we shut down for two years. Um, David Wright and resigned from president of the North coast fest. And we kind of, you know, at that time decided we weren't going to move it forward. Um, had some discussions, um, talked to a few people and decided to take over myself as president of the host fest. Um, check my sanity. To decide there you go. The That's what I was going to say. Was that a big <laughs> leap into? Yeah. It, it's something I, I, you know, I, I've been around the festival, but not nearly as uh, ingrained as I needed to be to take this position on. Okay. Um, it was a little bit of a learning curve. Very much so. Yeah. And so we kind of went back and forth, uh, trying to hire a director, trying to do some different things um, as a board, really recreated the board. And as we move forward last fall, we made the decision not to move forward. Um, you know, uh, Jessica, um, and I'm sorry, Jessica Ackerman and I, who was the vice president, mm-hmm. had a discussion after some sleepless nights from both of us and said, how the hell are we going to get this thing done? <laughs> and uh, and we had been paying attention to what epic events have been doing in West Fargo, with yep. lights and just some fantastic stuff. Um, and Todd Burning, who I've known forever, you know, had kind of been in my ear a little bit about offering help. Because Todd's from Minot, right? Yeah, Isn't he? Yeah. Okay. And, and you know, and Todd's done some fantastic things. The M building. There's a lot of stuff that he's got going on here in Minot as well. You know, it's his hometown. He wants to see us succeed, and he's been to I think every host fest on top of it. Okay. And, and been engaged and involved. Anyway, long story short, um, Jessica and I presented that uh, idea to the board. Said I think we should hire him, let him take over, and then uh, let uh, uh, Alex uh, Alexis tell you why she's here. Yeah. So. Same thing. Um, I grew up Berthold Minot uh, okay. area. I've been to 13 Husfest. I started going when I was three. Um, so I was actually living in West Fargo at the time. Um, and Todd Burning had called me. Um, I was an, an event coordinator working for West Fargo events, okay. um, which uh, working in the Epic office, but for West Fargo events, um, Todd is on the board of West Fargo events as well. Um, so Todd called me one morning and he said, have you ever heard of the Husfest? And have I, I heard of the Hoost Fest? Have he I said. heard of the Hoost Fest? Um, I went to college for special event management and those things, and I wrote my papers in college on the Hoost Fest because it was my okay. favorite event. Um, so he called me and asked if I'd ever heard of it, and I said yes, obviously. I'm familiar. Um, and he said, "Okay, well, could you move back to Minot in three weeks, and we're going to do this." He said, "If you say yes, we'll we'll move forward." And and so he said, "You've got a few days to decide." <laughs> Um, but we need to know pretty soon. And so I said yes, pretty much immediately. I think I gave it 24 hours and then said yes. And then three weeks later, I moved back to Minot. So I um, started. Yeah, because that's what I was going to ask. If you started at Epic before they took over the Who's Fest or if it was kind of like after. And it sounds like it was just bang, bang, same time. Yeah, I was. Yeah, well. So you were the critical for, piece, huh? <laughs> I Kind we, of. We knew all along she was hanging out there. I just, uh, yeah. we just knew she was going to be there to take her over. So. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just kind of, it's it's very full circle and crazy how everything fell into place yeah. um, with it. But, yeah, I was working, you know, alongside Todd and um, developed a really good relationship with Epic and, and you know, our, the team there. And so I, yeah, jumped on this and then moved back to Minot and started in October working on, working on the festival right away. Okay, cool. So how did you guys get in back? Peddling a little bit. How did you guys get into the business industry? Did you always know you were business minded that you wanted to go into a field like this? Or did one of you want to start a bakery one day? Or I actually did want to start a bakery at once (laughs) at one time. So um, I will say that. But um, I went to went to college and kind of bounced around a little bit playing with some some different things. And I've always been into events. And that was what sparked my interest. So 
Um, that's what I got my degree in and um, moved around a little bit and then landed in West Fargo with with an awesome job there as an event coordinator and um, just kind of evolved from there. And it's definitely a fit for me. Um, okay. And yeah, I was lucky enough to find that in my, my second year of college. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe you know, my story is completely different. I, uh, I worked for 36 years for a company called Investors Real Estate Trust. OK. I retired there in 2017. Um, after all those years, um, didn't really know what I was going to do. Um, got an offer to go to work at First Western Bank and Trust and you know, work in their business development and facilities. And, and throughout this time, been engaged in the, in the host fest. And okay. so uh, I really had no aspirations to run a festival. I'll be perfectly honest with you. But the importance of that, again, to this event, to this community, and I'm lucky enough to have an employer. Mm-hmm. that allows me to do that. I went and talked to Brenda Foster, who was bank president. And I said, you know, what do you think about this? It's going to be a time commitment. Yeah. She said, you know, the Hoven family who's you know, ran the bank or owns the bank uh, believes in community events. So, you know, figure it out. We'll make it work. And so I'm, I'm literally learning as we go. Um, so how did you get into, you said you've been on the board, what, 10 years? Something like that. Yeah. So what was the process like initially getting on the board, did they come to you and say, Hey, we want you on the board or did you kind of seek that out or how does that work? Because yeah. I'm not familiar with boards very sure. much. I'm not on one. I don't have one, yeah, you know, but how does that it's, work? It's really a little bit of both. They did reach out. Um, I think they, my business experience was what they were looking for. Maybe my contacts. Okay. And that's kind of what I think I bring to the table here. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if they're close to over 40 years in the business world, um, doing a number of things, I think that kind of was what they're hoping for. Um, okay. Know, so, when Karen Kresbach, who who's a longstanding member, probably one of the initial founders of the Rust Fest, reached out and said, "Hey, you know, we'd like to have you on the board. Um, see what you can, you can do." So, so yeah, that, that's how I got here. Um, again, I, I'm learning as fast as these guys are, and they're learning a lot faster than I am. So, yeah. so the goal of the podcast is to bring value to the people listening that are either starting a business, they have a business, they want to learn more about business. For people that are thinking about joining a board, and maybe this is more direct towards you, Tim, but thinking about joining a board or, you know, having a board for their organization, what would be some advice you'd give to them? Things to think about before doing that. You know, I think really what you want to seek out is some, somebody that you feel comfortable with that can be a mentor, but you want to also seek out some people that are going to challenge you um, and maybe have experience, whether not only in the business world, um, but maybe, you know, in the business that you're a part of. Okay. Um, you know, I think it's important. I, you know, I've been lucky enough to set on a number of volunteer boards as well as in my RET career sitting on their board. And so you learn a lot from the other board members as well, but, but you really want a board that's going to challenge you, but it's, that's committed to helping you. Um, okay. I think that's very important. Um, they have a vested interest in what you're doing. Um, and you're there willing to help. Um, but you want them to challenge you. You want them to make sure that, you know, they're yeah. going to push you. So pivoting a little bit more into Epic now, since you're directly hands-on with Epic, I assume, right? Yes. Okay. So the beginning of Epic taking over the Who's Fest, and you were kind of just thrown in the fire. Mm-hmm. What did the beginning stages look like? I assume it's kind of like when you start a business from the very beginning and you have no idea what you're doing. You're kind of just running around with your head on fire. Mm-hmm. What was that <laughs> like when, you were, when that first yeah. transition started? Yeah. So I, like we mentioned... Um, Hostfest didn't have, they had a couple employees left afterwards, um, okay. but ended up moving on as well. So I kind of started fresh. I was the only person in the office um, learning, you know, 43 years of something that's been happening in the yeah. community, um, but also starting fresh with new ideas and how are we going to do this differently than they did, you know, the last 43 years. Okay. So it was a lot of just learning figuring out this is my, you know, I worked in the event industry, but this was, you know, the first thing for me of this size and caliber. Mm -hmm. Um, So I started just, you know, researching, figuring out everything that was done. Um, In the past, uh, we really went over, you know, what works and what doesn't, Um, you know, in the past five years, what was, what was making the most sense for the festival, what was making the festival um, succeed and, you know, what areas of the festival you know, they, they may have been bringing some value, but you know, is, is how much value are they bringing? Um, so we really looked at that, um, and kind of started fresh with a new, new plan. Um, there are, you know, we had to take into consideration the, the culture and everything that has been Husfest for the last 43 years as well. So mixing, you know, those elements that, that Husfest has been and what Husfest is and kind of recreating the wheel a little bit like with the board, um, 
and with new employees. And mm -hmm. yeah, so just a lot of, a lot of learning and research and trying to figure out what the best options are to move forward. How does research really play into effect? So a lot of people go into things blind and they kind of just, okay, I'll just start doing stuff and see if it works. But how did the research help you in knowing what was right and what was wrong moving forward into the new Boost Fest? I think, you know, we did a lot of marketing surveys and we actually pulled those out from years past and we analyzed the marketing surveys from 2018, 2019, 2017, okay. and looked at those and, you know, found the information of what's working, what people actually want to see, as well as just looking over all of the numbers and budgets from years past and, you know, picking, picking those apart and figuring out where money was being spent and what made the most sense. Um, and that's, yeah. so, so pivoting a little bit into a question for both of you now, it's not an entirely new business. Obviously it's been around for 43 years, you said, but how do you, how did you guys, both the board and you yourself go about putting a creative spin on the new who's fest? Cause obviously you have to, it's, it's almost hitting a different demographic now, I think. Um, but how did you guys go about, you know, putting a creative spin on it? Yeah, I'll, I'll start, you know, the, the challenge is the Hoos Fest is in, in my opinion, got stagnant. Mm -hmm. Um, we needed to make a change and then and, and in that sense, we added some different board members, um, with some different views, uh, recognizing that if we don't go after the younger demographic, um, the Hoos Fest is going to die off. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's pretty simple when you look at the, the audience. Well, yeah, the people that are going there are getting older and older and older. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, we, we felt that was very important. And so, you know, it, it needed to be treated like a business. Um, you know, it's been a festival for a number of years, but we need to put the business spin on it. You know, look at each profit center, decide if it made some sense to, to Lexus's point and, and just go from the top to the bottom, figure it out and figure out what works. Um, but figure out a way to get the younger audience. Hence, I think a great, musical lineup um so yeah and that's that's one thing i noticed i think that was the biggest thing it's like when i was growing up yeah the the music is great and my dad loved going and that kind of thing but now i see the artist i'm like okay now i really want to go because i think i've only been there a couple of times but now i'm like really enticed to go yeah. um internally on your side i want to talk about the concerts now a little bit you guys had some obstacles you had to overcome here in the last little bit mm -hmm. business is all <laughs> about pivoting what did that process look like where you guys kind of panicking how did you go about filling those acts that you had to fill you know i'm, I'm gonna give uh, you know, a whole lot of kudos to epic and their team um, because it, if, without them we wouldn't be in the position we are okay i mean as you can imagine the first call that i got from lance who does our does the booking for epic mm -hmm. to let me know you know toby keith was going to cancel um like Okay. Probably couldn't have been a great phone call. No, it wasn't, wasn't a lot of fun, but he said, we're working hard towards finding somebody else. And as he's working through that process, then I, he, he sends me another call to tell me, you know, gives me another call about Lady A. And I probably won't tell you what the first words out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. PG um, podcast. Well, yeah. Um, but you know, he said, look, we're committed. We're looking, you know, we're working hard to find somebody else. And so their team you know, just did a fantastic job and came back to us with, with the lineup we now have and, at, unbelievable that they can get it done that quick. Yeah, it was, I got those calls from Lance right before you did and, um, your, your stomach drops and you think, okay, well, what's the next plan? And I think the number one thing is that we didn't give up and we didn't just throw an artist in there that wasn't going to make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, and to Lance, he, you know, put in so much work in those last couple of weeks trying to get acts booked and, um, it's not an easy process at all. And I think, you know, there were times where we went, maybe we should just give up, um, you know, and is this going to work? But I think you, you really have to persevere through those times and figure out what the best option to move forward is and not give up. And it's, it's easy to put your head down and think, you know, how is this going to work and how are we going to do this? But, you know, as, as long as you put in the work and, and realize that you have to keep moving forward, um, I think it all, it all works out because. Yeah. I mean, to the audience listening, no matter what you expect is going to happen, it's not, mm -hmm. there's going to be issues. There's going to be problems. What's that Mike Tyson quote? Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the yeah, face. Exactly. <laughs> I mean that that's, you know, and I think that's, you know, again, kudos to Epic for rebounding and, and pivoting and moving forward. You just have to be prepared to do that. Was there ever a thought process during the time when they said they can't come that you were just going to go with those slots unfilled? Was that ever a conversation or was it always from the beginning? We got to find someone else. Yeah, it was from the beginning. It's, you know, after Lance got those calls that they weren't 
coming. It was, Mm -hmm. we're calling every entertainment agency and getting the list and who are we going to fill this with? It was never, you know, are we, maybe we should just leave them empty. You know, there were obviously some options being thrown around of, you know, other ideas that we could do ways to fill those slots, but we would have never left them on, on, mm-hmm. you know, unfilled. Um, so yeah, it was, it was just a lot of phone calls and work and you know, negotiating with people to try to get us the best acts that we, that we could. Yeah. I mean, my biggest fear was things tend to happen in threes. Okay. Yeah. yeah and you thought one more was going to drop <laughs> No, what's going to happen. So I don't know, but this might be a selfish question on my end, but working with national bands, I always think it's cool that you're, you have these huge bands and acts coming to mine on North Dakota. Was it exciting for you? And obviously you've been doing it for longer than Alexis, but was it exciting getting to work and maybe your Lance is doing more of the hands-on working with them, but just hearing that information and kind of figuring out who can get here. Yeah. And I kind of, you know, worked with, I worked with Lance in West Fargo as well. So okay. um, I've been doing this for the last three, three years, um, with Lance as well. But yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting to learn the processes of what goes on behind it. Cause it's, it's, there's about six different channels before you actually get to the person who contacts the artist. <laughs> it's okay. It's, so you gotta go yeah, up the ladder. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, you're talking to an, an agency who's talking to another agency, who's talking to a manager, who's then talking to the, you know, the act. So yeah. you're really just getting the, <laughs> the initial contact and the, the chain yeah, as Reaction I say, a lot of people, that, but a lot of people probably don't think about the chain of command. Yeah. You can't just call big and rich. Yeah. Like, hey, you guys want to come? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's it's a process. There's a lot of steps. So I think, you know, it's when something like that happens, it's a lot of people being contacted. It's not just, yeah. you know, us calling one person and saying, what can we do? Um, mm-hmm. I mean, it is called us calling one person, but it's that person calling six different people yeah. as well. So um, it is interesting and it's it's fun. It's rewarding. Um, Lance always says an act isn't confirmed until they get there and they stay on the stage. <laughs> so there, there is always that. Um, but, but no, it's, it's a lot of fun and it's fun to get to be behind the scenes. And my favorite thing about, you know, what I do and being able to put on e- an event is um, just people's reaction afterwards mm-hmm. and, you know, the excitement and the fun that people have. And that's, that's what's most rewarding to me is being able to see that. Is it exciting? Is it exciting knowing, okay, my team did this and now all the people are happy and excited about it. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's what it's all about. We want to, we want to see people leaving with smiles on their faces and that's, that's the number one thing. That's the the big part of this is a successful host fest. Mm -hmm. The people after the fact are going to say, you know, thank goodness. Glad it came back. Um, Mm -hmm. That's, that's what we're hoping for. So the marketing spinning into the marketing wise, maybe hitting you guys touched on the younger demographic. What are some strategies or processes that you guys have implemented to hit that younger demographic? Obviously it comes with creative ideas, but how did you guys pivot into that realm of the marketing side? Yeah, I think in, in years past, you know, Husfest was very geared towards paper trails and mailing and, and those types of things. So we really this year went into the, the digital world, you know, digital ads, um, the ads you see on YouTube kind of hitting different channels where the younger demographic is going to see them things like the Spotify's and Mm -hmm. you know, the Hulu's and the Netflix's and putting ads out there as well. And then, yeah, just really getting, getting creative with our media. I think we really tried to revamp the, the Facebook page as well and make it fun and engaging. And I think that's the one thing you have to do to keep, you know, on the social media side of things, people engaged is make it fun, make it something worth their while that they're going to look at and not don't just post to post. Um, and I think that's what we really did this year. Um, and then, you know, marketing, marketing those acts as long as, you know, as well as Husfest is a fun environment for anyone to come of any age. Um, we're adding a ton of different elements that are going to engage the younger demographics. We're really trying to push those items out as well. Okay. So as far as um, when you're marketing to these younger demographics, um, I forgot what I was going to say. Lost my, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. But um so I'll come back to it. I'm sure I'll think of it. But what do you guys enjoy about the whole entire business process? So not even who's fe- who's fest specifically. Oh, I remember my question, by the way. I'll get to that next. But the process as a whole, just kind of working with a team and being around a whole team that's striving for one goal. I think the, you know, the most interesting part about our team and how we work together is that 
we have a board as well. So we are not just Epic events coming in. We are mm-hmm. the board, the North Coast Fest board, as well as our Epic events team. Um, there are two of us in the office, but we have a full team behind Epic that is out of West Fargo. So Epic has around probably more now, but over 56 employees, I believe. Okay. Um, so that are kind of behind the scenes working with us as well. So it's not just, it's not just me. It's just not just Nikki who's in the office. It's not just the board. It's, you know, it, there's a ton of people that are working together to, to pull this off and, and make, make it successful. It's not a one person job um, at all. And we've got a, a huge team that works together really well. Um, yeah. And I think really throughout my business career, it's, it's to, to build a culture that, that you know, your customer walks away satisfied. I mean, and, you know, really that it didn't matter when I was with IRET and we had a renter now on the, you know, the banking side, you got a customer who leaves the bank. We've got people at the host fest, um, through Epic, you know, we want them to be satisfied and happy with what you present. So you build a team, you build a culture that does that. And I think at the end of the day, it's all about, you know, you can have all these single accolades yourself, but it's all about the customer at the end of the day or the client or whoever it is. Um, getting back to the question that I forgot about 28 seconds ago, uh, when you guys are going about these creative ideas and new marketing ways, what does that look like? Are you guys all just sitting in a room kind of spitballing ideas or is everyone bringing their own ideas or how does that process look like for formulating these new ideas? I think it's a mixture of all of that. Um, you know, we come up with ideas. I think we present ideas to the board and kind of get their thoughts. And then we ask them for, for their, their take and what they think is going to work. Um, as far as, you know, our marketing team, we have weekly marketing meetings. We have three meetings a week that we're just going over. How, how can we do this? How can we make this fun? How, how are we going to market these people? Um, and we all come together with collective ideas. We also have, you know, we have brainstorming sessions where, you know, sometimes in our marketing meetings or in our hospice meetings each week, we say, okay, here's the topics that we're going to cover, come with ideas on how we're going to tackle this, this, and this, okay. or ways that we can move forward doing these different things. Yeah. And I think that you know, that's an example of putting a board together. For example, we've got uh, Harrison Ruby, who I'm not sure if maybe he's Harrison in his late twenties. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. He, he's on the board. Um, he's from Bismarck, has some ties to the Hus Fest, but he was willing and, and put the time in to go through our webpage and come back with, mm-hmm. you know, there's some, some issues here we should take care of, take a look at. Okay. So as you build that, you know, you, you talk on the business side, when you build a board, you want to make sure you have people with you know, certain attributes that, that tie to that. And, it, and he's given great suggestions, things I wouldn't have thought of. Um, and, you know, so you, you need that input from your board. And that's what I always thought because, I work with a small team, so like we don't have these big board meetings or, you know, brainstorming meetings, but I was always wondered if at these meetings and everything, if it's kind of just like throw shit at the wall, see what sticks, or if there's like, okay, let's do this, let's try this. But uh, yeah, that's a good look into it. Um, as far as growing year after year, uh, what does that look like for you guys? You know, if, is there a five-year goal for the Who's Fest? Is there anything that you guys are really striving to get to? You know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, this year is survival. I mean, uh, because we've had two years without a host fest. Mm-hmm. So we, we're kind of, you know, we've, we've, we've done the, the legwork, you know, done the budgeting and the research. We just want to see how the community is going to respond. Um, you know, we're, we think we've put together a great festival. We just need the people to get here. Um, you know, and we were fearful with COVID, you know, whether we're going to get the Canadian traffic. It sounds like that's opened up. Mm-hmm. Um, and people are back and I think want the event. There's, you know, you could see what happened at the state fair. Um, they had the people seems like people want to get out and want to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that's, that's uh, we want to survive and come out uh, good on the other end. Because this is a thing where people like, I don't know if they're going to this year, but in the past, wouldn't people like fly over from Norway and mm-hmm. all of those Scandinavian countries? Yeah, and, and we will have a, a sister city. The Shane delegation will be here. Okay. Uh, and Alexis was over and visited with them in May. Um, mm-hmm. So we want to keep that connection going. Okay. Uh, and, and that even you know, brings the you know, our city government. United State, Mount High, uh, public schools, school systems around here mm-hmm. um, involved in it. So I think you know we, we want to keep that coming. Um, and that's a challenge. Because I think I remember when I was growing up, I think my grandma would have people that would fly over and they'd stay at her house. Yeah. She had like eight extra bedrooms or something like that. <laughs> it sounds like uh, it. So she's like, oh, yeah, we got people over for the Who's Fest. Um, just a couple more questions for you guys here. Um, you touched on community. Why do you think community is so important for the Who's Fest, for the First Western Bank, for Epic Companies, all of these places that you guys represent? Why do you think community is so important? I mean, I think it's, it's the heart of the city. Um, you know, the community's got to you know, 
got to be together to make things happen. You know, I've been lucky enough to been involved in all kinds of different things, but it all comes back to what we can get done as a community. Because if you don't work together as a community, you get fractured and, you know, things happen. It, we can count a number of, you know, Mesa Arena, for example, you know, without the community coming together, without the hard work. I mean, I, when that first opened, I used to spend nights out there. I had a daughter that skated, so I was pulling plates and going through all that crazy stuff, yeah. painting locker rooms. But that's a community event, and, and that's what this is. You know, That's one of the reasons when I was asked to take it on, I thought it was so important to move forward because it's a community event that we can't afford to lose. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, and our, you know, we rely on volunteers. We rely on the support of the community to make this happen, um, and we really couldn't do it without them, you know, backing us and helping and being mm-hmm. willing to help. Um, and they've been able to do it for 43 years. So you're hoping, you know, the next, the next 10 aren't any different. Yeah. So <laughs> 43, 43 more years would be fantastic. <laughs> um, so that's all I got for you guys. Uh, where can, where can people find you? Where can people find the Who's Fest? Um, I'll obviously link all this stuff in the description below, but where can people find you? Yeah, all of our social media um, is just Norsk Husfest, H-O-S-T-F-E-S-T, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and then husfest.com is our website. Um, that's where all of our ticket links are, information on volunteering, any information you want on the board of directors, um, and everything Husfest. Go spy on Tim over there. <laughs> yeah, everything that, uh, you know, everybody that's listening, we need, we need your help, we need volunteers, we need you to buy tickets, um, mm-hmm. but... I think it's a great lineup. We're looking forward to, to getting rolling here and we're less than a month away. Yeah, exactly. So what are the dates? Let's say the dates so people know when they're listening to this. Obviously, the dates are out there, but what are the dates? End of September? September 28th to October 1st. Okay. So go get your tickets now. Go check them out on uh, all the social links. We'll drop that below. We'll put the website below. Tim, Alexis, thank you guys very much for coming on, spreading the information, and hopefully uh, it gets out to the people. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. We appreciate the, your time. That is episode 14 of the Mind Up Business Podcast. We will see you guys next Wednesday for episode 15.